Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Mike. You guys are rocking with me on Mike's Intellectual Corner on today's history reaction. We're going to be diving back into our epic history TV, Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon, Vietnam, Spain, 1809-1811. Guys, uh, other than this, please don't forget to check out my, uh, please don't forget to check out my scary content on my other channel. It's called Don't Look Back. I promise you it's gonna, if you like any type of scary, creepy type of content, it's gonna give you the, the, the creeps, essentially, it's really creepy. But with that being said though, let's go ahead and dive up in this. In 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, was at the height of his power. He had just won another crushing victory against Austria at Wagram, and imposed a humiliating peace treaty. But the war he'd started in Spain and Portugal, with his ill-judged invasion the previous year, continued to rage. Which is crazy too, because you gotta think, probably like over a quarter to maybe like what, uh, half of his men were still, probably not half his men, but probably a quarter of his men were still bogged down on the peninsula down there in the peninsula war down there so this might if you think maybe maybe not this might uh concerned or this might have uh you know uh was maybe the one of the catalyst to him losing an aspirin maybe a little bit i don't know his ill-judged invasion the previous year continued to rage napoleon had placed his own brother joseph on the spanish throne uniting a proud country against him his troops had dealt ruthlessly with popular uprisings, while routing a succession of Spanish armies. In February 1809, Marshal Lann overcame the heroic defence of Zaragoza in a brutal siege that cost 54,000 Spanish lives and 10... So unfortunately though, Marshal Lann is, I don't think, is no longer with us at this point in 1809, if I'm not mistaken. Because he, uh, he died of, I think, I want to say a few episodes back. I can't remember which war it was. I want to say it was Aspirin as well. In the comments. 1,000 Spanish lives and 10,000 French. But still, the Spanish and Portuguese remained defiant. And three months after their escape from Coruña, the British were back. In April, Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Lisbon to lead a small Anglo-Portuguese army. British redcoats would fight alongside Portuguese troops, who, with the help of British training... But unlike last time, I don't think Napoleon will be able to just come down there again to, you know, save his marshals, uh, his marshals' butts, essentially. So let's see how round two essentially goes. British redcoats would fight alongside Portuguese troops, who, with the help of British training, would soon prove themselves highly effective. Three weeks after arriving in Portugal, Wellesley moved against Marshal Soult's second corps, which had recently taken Porto. Soult and his troops, preoccupied with plundering the region, had no warning of the British advance, and were soon in headlong retreat, back through the mountains into Spain. See, that statement right there alone, it's just kind of crazy to think that even the Moors were able to come up and conquer essentially, what, 90% of the peninsula, other aside from the, like, what, north, I want to say northwestern mountainous part of it, um, I want to say. But, yeah, it's kind of crazy to think that. And this time, it's, it's hard, but, you know, and just like, this was like maybe not even 100 years to, you know, hundred years prior that you know the they were still you know doing the or trying to do the reconquista and all that stuff so not hundred years prior to this but hundred years prior to 1500s where uh, you know Henry of France was Henry the uh, fourth of France was having secured Portugal for the time being Wellesley planned a joint campaign with General Cuesta commanding the Spanish army of Extremadura. On the 10th of July, the two commanders met at Casas de Miravete to discuss strategy. 
Relations between these two allies were not straightforward. Spain and Britain had a long history of conflict. The Spanish were deeply suspicious of British intentions in Spain, while the British had a low opinion of the Spanish army, which they considered poorly trained and badly led. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, because if you think about it, I mean, not even like a decade prior to this, Great Britain sank all of, I don't know if it was all of it, but at least a good chunk of Spain's, uh, you know, uh, naval armada, essentially, with um, whenever they tried to team up against them with uh, Napoleon. So I can see that, yeah, obviously, this is just a war of, A, we have one common enemy, it's the French. So, you know what I'm saying? This is what it is, but which they considered poorly trained and badly led. Wellesley's request to take over command of Spanish forces was rejected, but the generals agreed to a joint advance up the Tagus Valley towards Madrid, to be supported by General Venegas advancing from La Mancha. In the face of their advance, Marshal Victor's first corps withdrew to Talavera, where he was joined by King Joseph and General Sebastiani's 4th Corps. The French plan was for Joseph's army to defend Madrid, while Marshal Soult led three corps down from the north to get behind and trap the Anglo-Spanish forces. But Joseph... That's a good plan, but they're going to have to hold on for uh, who knows how long. Uh, you know, and essentially, you know, trying to hold off and wait for the for the reinforcements to come back and stuff like that. On top of, I'm sure there's a lot of terrain, like, you know, I don't know if there's a lot of rocky terrain up there, but I'm pretty sure there's a lot of rocky terrain up by um, Asturias, Asturias, wherever that is up there, but yeah. Down from the north to get behind and trap the Anglo-Spanish forces. But Joseph, worried by Salt's slow progress, and General Venegas's advance on Madrid decided to attack at Talavera. Hopefully, unlike um, you know the Prussian the Prussians before this, the attack before you know before good backup is really around you doesn't backfire. I don't think it does, but let's we'll see. The Battle of Talavera saw British infantry bear the brunt of the French assault. They stood firm and repelled the enemy with disciplined musket fire and bayonet charges. Talavera was a small battle compared to the great clashes fought that year in Austria, but it proved that under Wellesley, Britain's small, well-drilled army was a force to be reckoned with even though in the short term, victory achieved little. And again, it just fits in with what exactly has been happening all around, all around it, because if you think about it, this, is how, this has been happening with on and off victories for, uh, I think the, the British, I want to say a little bit of Spanish, but it's you know, on and off victories since I think, what, 1808, since last year, essentially, so. I swear to God, that's like my, the word of the day today, essentially, but that's, yeah. Even though in the short term, victory achieved little. Warned of Soult's approach from captured dispatches, the victorious Anglo-Spanish army retreated. While King Joseph and Fourth Corps marched against Venegas' army, which they smashed at the Battle of Almonacid. That autumn, the Supreme Junta in Sevilla, Free Spain's effective government, raised two new armies for another attempt to liberate Madrid, planning to converge on the capital from north and south. I don't know, they probably already lost their, their chance. Their, uh, King uh, Joseph was able to push them back and he, uh, you know, freeing up room for martial assaults and all them. Essentially, I feel like there's in that word. I, I feel like it's, it's too late, you know what I'm saying? It's already too late. Planning to converge on the capital from north and south. But Wellesley, ennobled as Viscount Wellington for his victory at Talavera, had been so disgusted by the lack of Spanish cooperation that summer 
but he refused to risk his army. Predictably, Spain's inexperienced armies met with disaster. At Ocaña, they suffered their biggest defeat of the war, when a smaller force under Marshal Soult routed the Spanish army, taking 14,000 prisoners and 50 cannon. A week later, the army of the left was heavily defeated at Alba de Tormes. There was more bad news when Girona fell to the French after an epic seven-month siege. Obviously, it was way too late by this point, but it's crazy too, but, but because, like, you know what I'm saying, like, obviously it's about to get turned around, but, I don't know, they're getting really pummeled right now, though. By the Big seven-month siege. The Supreme Junta's plans to retake Madrid were in tatters, and southern Spain was now wide open to French attack. In January 1810, King Joseph marched south with an army of 60,000 men. Spanish resistance evaporated. Spain's Supreme Junta was overthrown in a coup as Cordova and Sevilla fell without a fight. Joseph, who still hoped to win over the Spanish with his progressive reforms, was welcomed by many as a savior from anarchy. Well, I wonder since he was able to do that. I wonder if, like, maybe if he would have been able to, like, say, um, I don't know, dispatch some, uh, some, um, some governors out there, some different governors to govern those cities so that that type of thing wouldn't happen, if that would have helped a little bit. Like his own French governors, you know what I'm saying? Not Spanish governors who, obviously, right now, during this type of war, he can't really trust right now. Just saying, maybe. Let's get back to the guys. Of reforms was welcomed by many as a saviour from anarchy. Only Cadiz held out, its defences reinforced by a British naval squadron, and was besieged by Victor's First Corps. Meanwhile, Napoleon sent Marshal Massena to Spain with 65,000 reinforcements. He was reckoned one of Napoleon's best marshals, and had just been made Prince of Essling for his heroics in the recent war against Austria. Massena was to lead a third French invasion of Portugal, take Lisbon and chase the British back into the sea. He laid siege to Theodad Rodrigo. See, for Vietnam, this is actually, I feel like this is going like overwhelmingly well for the French. You know, speaking war-wise, like, you know what I'm saying? Like a lot of it really isn't, but obviously I'm speaking way too early, so let me just shut up, but still, you know. All considering this has gone kind of kind of well, especially considering like you know what I'm saying we haven't even seen Napoleon on the battlefield at all, which usually we have to see him on the battlefield for any type of you know um, any type of victory or anything. It's somewhat some kind of in, in these videos anyway. See, he laid siege to Theodad Rodrigo, a fortified city controlling one of the main routes into Portugal which surrendered after two weeks' bombardment. Wellington, with only 33,000 men, to face Massena's 50,000, retreated. Massena crossed the Portuguese frontier and besieged Almeida. After just 13 hours of bombardment, a lucky French shot hit the Portuguese magazine. 70 tons of gunpowder went up in a devastating explosion that made all see i'm not gonna lie that was an amazing shot and i like how they uh they did like a two-layer thing in, into it to make it kind of feel 3d but i'm not gonna lie to you guys right now i'm kind of missing the history march in this one I, like I, I miss the battle sequences and stuff like that uh you know but i still love this i still love um epic history but definitely missing those uh history march collaborations of gunpowder went up in a devastating explosion that made all further resistance useless. It was a serious blow to Wellington, who'd been relying on Almeida's strong defences to buy him time. At Busaco, he found a strong defensive position and made a stand. Massena's uphill frontal attack failed. 
at a cost of 4,000 casualties. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank Wellington's position, and his retreat continued. As Massena's army neared Lisbon, his scouts reported something completely unexpected. Stretching across the Lisbon Peninsula... Yeah, he's way too far in, uh, to, I feel like, into Portugal right now. Um, I don't know. I, th I feel like he's getting, like, way too far from his, like, original starting point. Stretching across the Lisbon Peninsula, protecting the city from attack, they found a new chain of fortifications in two major lines. Known as the Lines of Torres Vedras, the British and Portuguese had been constructing these defences for more than a year. Now the lines bristled with more than a hundred forts, redoubts and batteries, manned by 30,000 troops and 250 guns. Massena soon discovered the lines were far too strong for him to... I know, that is a very, very fortified uh, attack formation. Um, I'm kind of curious, maybe... Because obviously I don't think that they're going to be able to break through. That's way too much. Uh, I don't think they have enough troops and enough or enough battery power to really break through that. But I'm thinking, do you think maybe if two very large, like I'm thinking like 100,000 at the minimum uh, size armies at the, and I'm talking both sides, so that's like 200,000 going both on both sides on the Lisbon and the other side, maybe to break that up. But even then, that may probably wouldn't make sense. I don't know. Lines were far too strong for him to attack. What's more, a scorched earth strategy had stripped the surrounding countryside of anything that might help the French. While Portuguese partisans attacked French supply columns as they struggled through the mountains to reach Massena's army. Massena faced a grim predicament. Starved of supplies, too weak to attack, unwilling to retreat. But throughout this standoff, it was Portuguese peasants who suffered most of all. When their villages and farms were burned, many took refuge in Lisbon, where thousands died of starvation and disease. I guess to the Portuguese, I guess the, the ends, I guess the Portuguese and the Great Britain, the ends justified the means in that situation. It's kind of messed up though. Whenever that happens to your own country and that, you know what I'm saying? But it is what it is. Died of starvation and disease. Damn, that's messed up. So they essentially, because he wasn't able to break through into Lisbon, he was, he was uh, essentially stripped of that title. Is that what I'm getting? But I don't know. I'll, let me shut the fuck up. Because obviously he's going to say something. Back in France, Napoleon had been preoccupied with his divorce from the Empress Josephine, and then a new marriage to Archduchess Marie Louise, daughter of the Emperor of Austria. She was now expecting their first child. Nevertheless, from Paris, Napoleon sent frequent orders to his marshals in Spain and Portugal, urging them to take more aggressive action. But when these orders arrived, weeks later, they were usually out of date and showed little understanding of the problems his marshals faced. I feel like that might have been a huge problem for the entire time, but maybe not because, at least not in main, like, main body Europe, because main body Europe is kind of kind of a small continent, you know what I'm saying? So I don't, maybe it wasn't as hard to do that in these other, these past uh, battles and wars that we've been seeing, but going, it's kind of weird seeing it going from say, Paris to Germany or something like that, it's not that far, but seeing it go from Paris all the way down to Madrid, it's kind of far, which is kind of crazy to think about, but yeah. Little understanding of the problems his marshals faced. He now ordered Soult, based in Andalusia, to go on the offensive to draw enemy forces away from Lisbon, so Massena could take the city. Soult laid siege to Badajoz, a fortified city that controlled the southern route into Portugal. When 12,000 men of the army of Extremadura marched to its relief, they were routed by Soult, 
after which the city tamely surrendered, giving up 8,000 prisoners and vast quantities of stores. It was another heavy blow to Spain's armed forces. But remarkably, despite such disasters and their many blundering generals, the Spanish troops remained willing to fight, the courage of the rank and file undimmed. Yeah, but at the end of the day, that can only get you so far without the right leadership, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I guess it's kind of hard to explain, but to me, that can only get you so, so far without that right leadership, you know what I'm saying? Undimmed. Victor's first corps, besieging Cadiz, had now been so weakened to support other operations that the Anglo-Spanish garrison decided to attack. The Allies landed along the coast to strike at the French siege lines from the rear. But they were ambushed by the French at Barossa. Despite heavy losses, the Anglo-Portuguese rearguard fought off the enemy. But a furious falling out between British commander Sir Thomas Graham and his Spanish counterpart General La Peña threw away any advantage. Soult, alarmed at these developments, marched back to Andalusia. Meanwhile, Massena, out of food and with no prospect of reinforcement, had no option but to retreat. Wellington's army pursued, discovering evidence of several appalling atrocities committed by the French against Portuguese villagers. I'm guessing that might be bad because maybe the Portuguese are going to want, obviously, revenge maybe causing a turning point or even more of a turning point maybe with the civilians i'm thinking i don't know these villagers there were running battles with the french rear guard brilliantly commanded by marshal ney until he was sacked by massena for criticizing his leadership Having chased the French out of Portugal, Wellington besieged Almeida. Massena's army, now rested and reinforced, marched to its aid. The two armies clashed again at Fuentes de Onuro. In two days of heavy fighting, Massena failed to break through Wellington's position to relieve Almeida. Damn. Can you imagine getting just freaking just your fight? See, that's one of my biggest fears right there that in that picture is fighting as an infantryman and just getting stuck somewhere in the back because you can't like you can't be looking anywhere everywhere at once. And obviously he looks like he got a freaking saber through the back of the neck. That is brutal. But yeah. Massena failed to break through Wellington's position to relieve Almeida. The fortress fell the next week. But to Wellington's fury, British bungling allowed most of the French garrison to escape. Massena had lost 25,000 men in Portugal. Now he'd lost Almeida too, and a string of bad decisions, not least to bring his mistress with him on campaign, had cost him the respect of his officers. The Marshal, whom Napoleon had once nicknamed the Dear Child of Victory, was recalled to France in disgrace never to hold senior command again. Okay, so now I can see why, you know, he took he took his power to his head, obviously, which, and seems like he kind of lost touch with his men horribly, which I can see now why um, Napoleon demoted him horribly and, and wanted to make an example out of him. And he lost, lost all those men, like, what do you say, 25,000 men? That's ridiculous. That's a lot. That's, those are men. Souls, you know what I'm saying? That's not, that's not, you know, equipment. That's men. That's crazy, you know? France in disgrace, never to hold senior command again. Napoleon sent Marshal Marmont to replace him. Meanwhile, Marshal Beresford, the British commander of Portugal's army, was sent to retake Badajoz with 20,000 British and Portuguese troops. When Soult approached with a relief force, Beresford marched to meet him at Albuera. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war, 
around 6,000 casualties on each side, with more than a third of the British infantry killed, wounded or captured. Marshal Soult declared, There is no beating these troops, in spite of their generals. I always thought they were bad soldiers. Now I'm sure of it. I had turned their right, pierced their center, and everywhere victory was mine. But they didn't know how to run. See, I'm not gonna lie, that voice threw me off a little bit, but you see, this seems like more of a, like really a huge kind of a slug match, really. Um, because even with that, the French are still like they're still being able to like you know get these victories. Other than Messina, Messina just left up really, but still, you know what I'm saying? They didn't know how to run. Soult had been checked, but he was determined to save Badajoz. The newly arrived Marshal Marmont marched to his aid, and they advanced again. This combined army forced the British to abandon the siege. But when Wellington withdrew to a strong defensive position across the Portuguese border, Soult and Marmont did not pursue. French commanders in Spain had learned grudging respect for Wellington, and for the steadiness of his troops. For now, the war in Spain had entered stalemate. While British, French and Spanish armies crisscrossed Spain and Portugal, another war was fought every day in the mountains, hills and woods. From 1808, Spanish and Portuguese civilians, militias and ex-soldiers began taking up arms against the hated French invader. They waged a war of ambushes. Okay, see now I see why where the Vietnam starts to come in because as we all know, whenever civilians who aren't obviously trained and who, who don't do any type of formations or any of that, that's what comes in the, the guerrilla fighting and stuff. Yeah. They waged a war of ambushes and hit and run raids, known in Spanish as La Guerrilla, the Little War. Its fighters became known in English as guerrillas. Britain's Royal Navy supplied vital weapons, stores and money, often landing them behind enemy lines. Much of Spain's rugged countryside fell under the control of the guerrillas. North of Madrid, Juan Martín Diez, an ex-soldier known as El Empecinado, the stubborn, led a guerrilla band 6,000 strong. In Navarre, Esposimina, a former peasant, ran a highly organised band that caused havoc for the French, capturing convoys and couriers on the strategic burgos Bayon road, and branding Viva Mina on the forehead of collaborators. While in the west, Julian Sanchez, known as El Charo, led the self-styled Lanceros de Castilla. El Charo in it's crazy that I feel like almost without the Spanish civilians, the, the peninsula might have almost gotten conquered without the, the civilians in Wellington, almost, you know what I'm saying? Because if you think about it, there's nothing else, you know, the Spanish uh, army aren't really doing that much. And the, I mean, the Portuguese are, I think are doing pretty or okay, but again, they need help with from the British. I feel like, I don't know. El Charo himself wore a French hussar's cap, its eagle symbolically turned upside down. There were dozens more bands operating across Spain, though a few were no better than bandits, terrorising civilians as often as the enemy. The guerrilla war was merciless, marked by hideous atrocities on both sides. A French soldier's greatest fear was to be taken alive by the guerrillas who often tortured their prisoners before killing them. Mm, that seems like it might have caused a little bit of suicide then. I, I feel like maybe because, I mean, would you rather that than, you know, saying get tortured and then you're going to die anyway? It seems like that kind of might have happened also, maybe. 
Let me know, guys, if that if that was the case. Prisoners before killing them. Tens of thousands of French troops were tied down by this people's war, guarding outposts or patrolling the countryside. The roads were so dangerous for French messengers that they required cavalry escorts of 200 men or more. Many still didn't get through. Their valuable dispatches forwarded to Wellington, for whom they became an invaluable source of intelligence. The war in Spain would ultimately cost the lives of 240,000 French soldiers. As was typical in wars of this era, most died from disease. But more died fighting guerrillas than in battle against the British and Spanish armies. It's almost crazy because at this point it almost seems like if Napoleon would have never even, of, say, put, you know, overthrew the the royal monarchy that he didn't like, that he called decadent and all that stuff, and put his brother in, and instead of maybe even put it, maybe if he would have even put another Spanish person in, he would have not only had almost close to 240,000 freaking, uh, which we call it, extra soldiers for the upcoming Russian uh, invasion that's upcoming. Yeah, it's just crazy to think about. It's a big what if, almost, if you think about it. Than in battle against the British and Spanish armies. However, it was the twin threat, a well-led regular army under Wellington and a popular insurgency that left the French facing an impossible strategic dilemma. If their armies remained dispersed to fight the guerrillas, Wellington could attack. But if they concentrated to defeat Wellington in battle, huge swathes of the country would quickly fall to the guerrillas. This was Napoleon's Vietnam or his bleeding ulcer, as he called it. A war that cost his empire an average of 100 casualties every day, with little prospect of victory. Enough, freaking, uh, and in 1812, as Napoleon launched like. his gigantic invasion of Russia, Wellington and the guerrillas launched their own offensive that would turn the war in Spain on its head. Thank you to all the pat. Hey right, guys, I'll go ahead and end it right there. <clears throat> so with that being said, yeah, I guess at the end of this is where we start seeing the the uh, turning point of the Peninsula War, where we start seeing the French really start to lose. Because, like I said, throughout the entire video, they weren't really doing that bad. It was just a lot of stalemates, but they were still getting a lot of victories out of it too, and they were able to do so without Napoleon's presence, which. It's kind of rare um, in these videos, and I don't know if it's rare in actual history, but with that being said, though, thank you guys for, again for joining me on another History Reaction video. Please uh, join me on my next video where we will be doing our uh, uh, kings and generals, our, um, we'll be continuing our uh, Muslim conquest, our expansion uh, series. Uh, also, please don't forget to uh, check out my scary, creepy ghost video type of content it's called Don't Look Don't Look Back. Uh, there's a, I have a, my channel, or both of my channels are linked together, so if you just go to my channel thing, you'll see it. Uh, with that being said, uh, I'll see you guys when I see you. I'm out. Mm -hmm.